Thank you very much for coming back. I uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch. We've got a, an equally interesting afternoon session uh, ahead of us. And we're going to start off um, talking about democracy, European democracy, how uh, it may develop over the next um, 10 years, because that's our theme. How will the European Union be in, in 10 years' time? Um, and our first speaker is going to be Baroness Smith, um, who's, I hope I can say without uh, been contradicted, an old friend of the Federal Trust. Thank you very much for joining us, Judy. And um, no, and, no, and a trustee of the Madison Trust. I'm sorry, I should have said that as well. <laughs> a trustee of the Madison Trust. So doubly qualified, quite apart from uh, uh, academic and, and um, political excellence. Judy, can you give us 10, 15 minutes and um, just throw out some ideas about how the European Union might meet the challenges of democracy and democratization over the next 10 years? I should do my best. I have cunningly put my computer onto full screen so I can no longer see the time properly. Um, so if you think I'm burbling on for too long, I will expect one of David or Brendan to jump up and down and say, no, no, you've gone on for far too long. Can I just check? Can you hear me OK down the line? Can yeah, indeed. Everyone can hear you yeah. very well. Thank you. I'm in a new office, um, so it's the first time that I've tried the Zoom this way. Um, I tried to log on this morning. Apparently, I wasn't allowed to log on because I wasn't speaking this morning, but it gave me an opportunity to realise that you could only see a tiny bit of me. So hopefully you can see and hear me. And I suppose my slightly gloomy um, thoughts. So I apologise for not being present in the room. On the other hand, given at a certain point, you'll probably hear me coughing, you will probably be quite glad that I'm not in the room because whatever I've caught from the students, you don't really want to have. <laughs> um, the other thing, Brendan kindly said that I'm an old friend of the Federal Trust. I've also been working on European elections and democracy in Europe for longer than I care to remember. I started my master's in Oxford in 1991, and it was on turnout in European Parliament elections. And my doctorate was then on elections to the European Parliament. And I could conclude that they didn't at that stage, and it went up to the 94 elections, yet meet the expectations of the founding fathers. And in those days, it was perfectly acceptable to say the founding fathers. We didn't need to um, try and think about whether we should say the founders or make sure that we weren't saying anything uncontroversial. But it seemed so easy then. We'd only had four sets of European Parliament elections. And yes, turnout was quite low. And yes, they seemed to be national second order elections. But the prospect was still there of having fully fledged European democracy. And I guess over the intervening 30 years, I have become a little jaded. So I apologize for being jaded. I'm hoping that at the end of the day, Andrew Duff is going to be contributing in his normal, inimitable style, which will be very positive. But the topic that we've got, the title was Democratic Challenges. It wasn't, are we going to have a wonderfully democratic Europe in, in 2033? But I've got a title of Democratic Challenges, so I'm afraid I did think about talking about challenges. And I think there are three different aspects to think about. The pan-European level in terms of European Parliament elections, national elections, so the national level, and then direct democracy, the issue of referenda, citizens' assemblies, and the like. But also, we need to think about not just the EU27, but as we were hearing about this morning, an enlarged Europe and the prospect of a Europe by 2033, are we really going to have 35 member states? Not sure. But if we're thinking about that sort of expansion, we're not talking about expansion to Norway and Iceland. We're talking about expansion to Southeastern Europe, maybe to Ukraine, maybe to Georgia. What are some of those implications going to be? Because I think it's important to remember that every time the European Union has enlarged, it's brought in a different set of complexities. 
And that goes right back to 1973 with the first enlargement. If you think about the party systems of the founding six, they had Christian democratic parties. Denmark and the UK joined in 73 with their conservative parties, didn't quite fit in the same way. And if you look at the big bang enlargements of the 2000s, one of the things that's very noticeable is that there was far more fragmentation of the party systems. I'll come back to the specific concerns of populism and questions about Euroscepticism and pro-Russian sentiment in a moment. But I think it is just where, worth bearing in mind that however positive we might be about the prospect of enlarging the European Union to the southeast and east, there will be knock-on consequences for decision-making within the European Union and also for its democratic status. And obviously, they are the sort of issues that were being looked at by the 12 experts in the Franco-German group that was, again, being talked about this morning. Um, where I understand from one of the 12 that the lingua franca was actually English because there was one person that couldn't speak, I can't, and I generally can't remember is a German who couldn't speak French or vice versa. So their lingua franca was English, which I suspect in some ways has been easier for people now that the United Kingdom is no longer in the EU because it's not, <laughs> you know, we're sort of pandering to the British anymore. We're just using a common language. but. I think we've got two problems facing democracy at the European level, or at least, no, arguably three problems. I was hoping to get to it just as lots of P's, but one is the people, the second are the politicians, and then the third is really, I think, institutional, so I couldn't get the third P. But starting with the politicians, the discussion earlier on, one question, I think it might have been from Sandy about a lack of leadership in Europe. And Brendan said, and I can understand why, that, well, if we can't see yet at the moment who the leaders will be in 10 years time, that doesn't matter, they will emerge. But I think one of the problems that European democracy has faced over the decades, and I really do mean over the decades, and still faces, is that there are not enough national leaders in Europe who are willing to take a leading role in advocating for Europe and doing what has been needed and been sorely lacking, which is if something goes well, say that it's the European Union that has achieved it. Because what we always get are national leaders taking the credit for things that go well and blaming Brussels for things that go wrong. Brussels, Strasbourg, whatever, but the EU institutions. And it's very easy, this side of the channel, to assume that that is about the British political class, the British media. But if you look at other national capitals as well, there's a similar tendency. And I think that's something that we really need to see a change. We need the national leaders in Europe to be more positive in their rhetoric and actually demonstrate some leadership. I think Macron has tried that, but I think we're not hearing enough of it. But the second problem, the people, um, and I'm being slightly facetious in saying the people, because actually we have to have the people on board. Otherwise, whatever we do about institutional reform of Europe, it's not going to appear that Europe is democratic. And I think there is a long standing problem about engaging citizens in Europe. But I do have a real sense of déjà vu, and that's partly why I said maybe I'm going to sound a little bit jaded. But go back to 1979. Part of the reason for having European Parliament elections was to engage the citizens. We'd already begun to lose the permissive consensus. By 2000 and the Nice summit, where the member states are all trying to prepare, prepare the institutions for enlargement, they also say, but we're too distant from the citizens. And we get the Convention on the Future of Europe. And then we get the Constitutional Treaty and eventually Lisbon. A decade of discussing how do we bring Europe closer to the people and a decade that suggested that actually Europe was getting further away or at least distant if you look at the French, the Dutch and the Irish referendums. 
And with an enlarged Europe of 27 now, including um, Bulgaria, Romania and Croatia, which weren't there at the time of the constitutional treaty, and the prospect of further enlargement, then I think the time has come to think about what ways can be used by European level leaders and national leaders to try and remind the citizens of Europe of the benefits of membership. And Mary was saying earlier on about the difference between the founding members and the later members who were maybe looking for security and protection. Whatever citizens are looking for, at the moment, they don't seem to have been finding it in Europe. And while I think there is something to be said for institutional reform of the sort that was being proposed by the 12 experts, I think we also need to be a little bit careful. In terms of efficiency and effective decision making, then having more QMV sounds like a good idea. And yet, if you look at one of the problems in the Central and East European states, the frustrations about dealing with um, relocation of refugees, the objection stems back to decisions being taken by qualified majority voting. So the institutional reforms that would make decision making easier do also contribute to democratic questions that need to be thought about and listened to. And that is currently, I think, exacerbated by the party politics in some of the member states, particularly in the Visegrad countries. And while John was saying earlier that he thinks China is so much part of the problem, the influence in Europe, I think in terms of national politics, we have to look at Russia, Russian interference in elections, but in particular, the relationship between somebody like Urban and Fidesz in Hungary, Fico in Slovakia. And so we've got a real issue, I think, about reminding the leaders and the citizens of some member states of the benefits of integration. But dealing with the domestic level and persuading people of the benefits of integration is something that needs to be done, but is, is going to be a challenge. Unless there is a quantum change in the integration process so that, again, suddenly people say, this is why Europe matters. Arguably, conflict in Europe and in the Middle East may provide that if people really feel we are stronger and more secure together. Finally, I think there is the question of if we need institutional reform, constitutional reform and more um, treaty reform, then we're going to get back into that whole cycle of referenda and actually learning the lessons of how to run an effective referendum is something that I think the leaders of any country that is likely to have a referendum should think about. If you want to see the horror story, look at the United Kingdom. If you want to see best practice, look at Ireland, where they've actually gained a lot of experience in holding referenda and have become very used to dealing with repeated referenda, but also engaging citizens th through citizens' assemblies. And I think that will be the sort of lesson that could be learned to try and ensure that we enhance direct participation and try and make sure that we can win citizens over so that we can have a positive and constructive European demos that leads to fewer democratic challenges and more democratic participation. And just finally to say, rather like Brendan, right at the start of this morning, um, if I had a choice, I would have us back in the European Union, um, preferably yesterday. Um, I'm currently 54. I very much hope that within my lifetime, we might be back in. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have such um, long lasting genes. Nobody in my family has ever got um, anywhere close to 90. So I'm aware that um, we may not get back. Um, the democratic process in the UK may not take us back to the democratic processes in the EU in my lifetime, but I very much hope I'm wrong. <laughs> well, we hope you're wrong for a number of reasons. So. <laughs> 
but uh, we hope you enjoy many years after we get back into the European Union. I think that's, that's the way to phrase it. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's now for Andrew to talk, take up the challenges um, and tell us what he thinks about the, the very pertinent questions which Julie has raised. Andrew. Thank you. And I, I feel at this point I should start by uh, plugging a book that, of which Julie was uh, editor. I heard reference that the horror stories of referendum. So I'd recommend the, the edited collection, uh, the Palgrave Handbook of, of European Referendums uh, for anyone who's interested in that subject. I think it's, it's important to give credit for that work. Uh, I'm glad we led into the to the UK there, but my, my research interests at the moment, I think are relevant to what we're talking about today because I'm looking at populism and democratic backsliding across the world and then considering in particular how it applies within within the UK, which I think is very re relevant. And also more generally, my expertise is, is the UK constitution. I've taken particular interest in, in the whole Brexit process. So I think Julie did a really good job there of, of saying what are the institutional, functional uh, democratic problems for the EU, how it might approach them, the challenges it faces, uh, the possibilities of expansion. And again, I'm glad we mentioned the uh, the expansion issue, because when we talk about the possibilities of expansion of the EU over the next decade or so, I'd, I'd like to put the UK in there as being uh, one of the countries that I hope and believe will be part of an expansion of the EU at some point. And I'm I'm uh, I'm 50, so I'm I'm much more optimistic. I'm barring <laughs> nothing bad happening. I'll I'll be around, and I hope as many people as possible watching this and and in in the room are around when we rejoin or at the very least when we uh announce when we have a government that announces a clear intention of rejoining i think that's the critical thing not to think about how long or how difficult it is but think about actually a, a leading politician being willing to say uh leaving the eu was a big mistake and and we'd like to rejoin, please. But, but so, but to come back to, to today's subject, to which all of this I think is relevant, I'm going to try and be a bit more. Give, give a, I don't. I don't think actually the previous talk was necessarily pessimistic at all, because I think it it actually set out the issues that are being faced. But I'd like to uh, leave people coming away in in a strange way feeling good about this, because I think what we've seen in the UK over the last few years all the problems we've had still ongoing actually helps to illustrate how effective the EU is as a dem democratic institution. I think bef up to this point, we've never really had a good counterfactual of what it looks like when you cease to be part of the EU in a, in a major, a major country with large population size. So, you know, respect to, to Greenland, but I think that, that the UK being being an example of a, of a large country with a large economy leaving, what happens? And I think some of the things we've seen in the UK in recent years show that actually the EU is, a, is potentially, and certainly was in the case of the UK, a force for democratic stabilisation. And I think that the main point I'd like to draw from all of that, I'll, I'll illustrate this further in a moment, but the main point I'd like to draw from all of that is that when we talk about EU democracy, I don't think we should see it as just a simply a separate layer above uh, the democracy of the member states. It's part of it. The two things are inextricably linked, and they certainly were in the case of the, of the UK, although we probably couldn't see it until leaving became a prospect and then a reality. I don't think it's possible for those who are pro-EU as those as well as those who are anti-EU to fully appreciate what that in, that interrelationship was and what an important source of democratic stability the EU was for the UK. The UK is uh, inherently an unstable political project. Doesn't mean it's doomed to fail, doesn't mean it's the only unstable political project in the world, but it has certain instabilities and, and powerful tensions built into it. They relate to the way it came about, came about in a, in a slightly ad hoc fashion, a series of fusions between different states. First, Wales uh, was legally absorbed into England in the 16th century. Then in the uh, early 18th century, 
uh, Scotland and England uh, formed a union. You could argue, you know, a different way of describing that is that Scotland was forced into a union with England. Either way, there was the union. Then the even more controversial union with Ireland followed. And if we take the beginning of the UK, which conventionally is as being the point of the union with Ireland, the Act of Union 1800, from then on, uh, the status of the UK has been a subject of controversy, tension, and at, and at times spilling over into actual violent conflict in Ireland. And and the legitimacy of the of the state to significant sections within that state was in doubt. And eventually, one of the ways we arrived at of, of trying to manage this problem was what we now call devolution. First, it was attempted in uh, Ireland and then in Northern Ireland for, and actually ran in Northern Ireland from the 1920s to the 1970s. That fell apart with, with, with the, the troubles in the 1970s. Then it came back for Northern Ireland, although it's been suspended a lot, Scotland and Wales from the late 1990s onwards. So it's been a way of dealing with it, but I, I th and, and some might argue that's helped to manage some of those tensions within the uh, UK, but also brought other difficulties with it. And but I think the the extra ingredient in all of that, which wasn't fully appreciated until we left, was that being part of this wider project, the European Union, which we were throughout the period of uh, of devolution of the second wave of devolution, made it possible for that to function. And if we think about the democratic legitimacy of the EU and whether it's accepted as being a a proper source of legal, political, constitutional authority, it was actually very effective for the UK. And there were parts of the UK, in particular Scotland and Northern Ireland, where for a large section of the population, I wouldn't necessarily say a majority, but a substantial se section of the population, law that was of EU origin was more acceptable than law that came out of the UK Parliament. And that's a problem we've seen since leaving, because in order to protect the UK single market, there's have to, the powers that once resided at EU level have had to be transferred to UK level, which means that the UK Parliament, driven by the UK government, is, is able to legislate for the whole UK in areas which were, which are in some cases fall within devolved responsibilities and were previously subject to the ultimate authority of the EU. And that's proving to be hugely controversial. Now, obviously, there are forces within the UK, uh, say in Scotland, who want to make it controversial, who are deliberately going to object to it. But the problem we're seeing is that it's actually quite difficult for some of the mechanisms that were arrived at to deal with these intentions within the UK system to function outside of the European Union. And to give you a clear example of the problem there, we're seeing a breakdown in the Seoul Convention by which uh, UK Parliament led, is, is not normally supposed to legislate for devolved matters contrary if, if uh, it hasn't achieved the consent of the devolved territories to that legislation. Time and again now, we're seeing devolved legislatures uh, withholding cons consent to legislation passed at UK level, but the UK Parliament, again, driven by the UK government, proceeding nonetheless to pass that legislation. So we're seeing a breakdown in this important mechanism by which uh, the system of devolution was reconciled with parliamentary sovereignty in the UK. So that's a, that's a serious challenge to the way in which the UK constitution functions. And it's come about precisely because we have pulled out of the European Union. So that for me is an example of how the European Union can help to make a democracy more functional. And there are other states within, still within the EU that have similar, not identical, but similar kinds of divisions within them related to nationality, I think maybe of Belgium, of Spain, that are within the EU. And I wonder whether the EU, even though it might not be immediately apparent, is actually helping with them. However difficult they might seem, perhaps they could get a lot worse were there not an EU there. So that's why I think the UK case bears close examination as illustrating what happens when the EU 
isn't there and how actually effective the EU can be. There's obviously a further dimension to this. The more dramatic dim uh, dimension to this is people who actually don't want to be part of the e UK at all, partly because of Brexit. Obviously, that's the case for some people in Scotland and for some people in Northern Ireland. We see the problems there. And again, being in the EU was perhaps a way of managing that, that difficult tension without actually having to really see through the question of how do you leave the UK? What does that look like? What's the mechanism by which we do it? So the EU, although those problems, those tensions are really, really difficult to resolve, I think particularly in the case of Northern Ireland, uh, I think the EU was the best option one can think of for trying to at least reconcile them to some extent. That's why we see these enormous problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Windsor Agreement. They're not going away. The DUP, last time I checked this morning, aren't back in, aren't back in government and haven't been for a long while. These things are all, all traceable, not exclusively, but to a large extent, to Brexit. And when people talk about their objections to the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol or the difficulties with that or with the Windsor Agreement, what they're actually talking about is their objections to Brexit, because all those things are are an attempt from a, a range of different possible imperfect ways of doing it to try and deal with the problems of Brexit. So again, I think actually out of all of this story, the EU by by default, but but you know by not being there shows how important it, it, it was to be there. I think all of that's important. The other thing I wanted to make is to make a more general point about populism. Since we've left the EU in since the UK has left the EU, we've seen, I think, a surge at elite level in populism and the people most closely associated with the Brexit project are also the most populist type of politicians in the UK. And I think we've seen populist ideas and viewpoints being expressed more openly at higher level by people, including people within government when they're saying these things than we've ever seen before, I think, in any comparable period in, in the UK. Again, that's directly linked to, to Brexit and again shows that anti-EU forces, when they're successful, are uh, given greater of freer reign outside the EU than they would be in it. So again, it kind of demonstrates in its absence that, uh, that the EU was, at least in the UK, a force for holding down some of these, uh, these populist voices and tendencies. That's an important, important observation, I think, that we'll, that we'll need closer looking at. And it, it does say to me also that when we think about this issue of populism in the UK, in Europe as well, that the EU itself is often a direct target for the populace. I think that tells us something. Why do they hate the EU? Why do they not like the EU so much? To me, rather than viewing this as being that that says the EU is a problem and it has to constantly reform itself. I'm sure it does have to reform itself, but rather than the EU being the problem that's causing populism, maybe a way of reconfiguring that is asking, well, why do these people dislike the EU and its values so much? Perhaps that actually is something good about the EU, that it's being targeted and disliked by these people, rather than saying the EU is causing these things to happen by being out of touch with the population, whatever that means. So for me, that's interesting. And, and the EU, and certainly in the UK, the European Union acts, can act as a poll for those people within society that actually are not only, not only pro-EU, but are supportive of a broader range of values that are, that are supportive of democracy. So the EU, again, is a force there. And before, and again, I think Brexit's been, in some sense, has been a positive experience because it led to hundreds of thousands, even millions of people demonstrating in support of the EU. You never would have seen that in the UK before. You never would have seen people waving EU flags around. And if you look at the way in which uh, polling, uh, polling reveals people's collections of, of tendencies and viewpoints, those who support the EU are also supportive of a much broader range of, of values and principles, all of which are far more supportive of democracy than those on the other side of that divide who, who, don't, uh, who don't like the EU. So again, the EU there, rather than being seen as a source of a problem, as a thing which needs to change itself and justify itself more, actually, I think, 
from this EU, from the UK perspective, we can now see was actually a positive force. And that's that's the optimistic bit I'd like to, to put to you today. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much indeed. Excellent. I have one or two questions, but I'm perfectly prepared to take my place behind the many, many hands which are being raised. Uh, Adrian Hyrline and Trout. Um, my, my point is going to focus more on the democratic and values position within the EU. We have uh, issues in Hungary and Poland regarding LGBTQ rights and trans rights, and that will lead on to women's rights and rights around abortion and things like that. And that's part of the difference between, we had um, uh, earlier comments around European values and Russian values. And that worries me that we are trying to um, make sure that our European values keep still, which is part of the EU's uh, equality network and beliefs, which isn't part of the Russian uh, comparison that we had earlier in, a, in an earlier conversation before lunch. So how do people think, or how do our two experts feel about how we must use those values as a wider mechanism um, across the EU as a, as a positive uh, challenge? Graham? Yes, Graham Bishop. Um, very interesting presentation by both of you. Uh, a, a democratic question. <clears throat> Can you envisage any way in which the EU, uh, sorry, the UK could join, I don't use the word rejoin, join the EU without a referendum? And if so, um, what lessons, well, if we have to have a referendum, what lessons should we learn? A quick uh, question to Julie. Um, you left Turkey out of the potential membership, as I did. Did you do that deliberately? You put it totally behind you. We are talking about democracy, not just in the European Union, or, or lack of democracy, but also in the in Britain. Uh, so we should solve both problems at one stroke. What is the solution? Graham just asked, what would be the manner of uh, accepting the uh, future uh, constitutional uh, commission um, proposing new treaty. And we try to refrain from any referenda, remembering Brexit and perhaps advising the European Union, don't do it, what we did. So what's the alternative? Actually, the alternative has already been tested. It's the future of Europe conference. In that conference, we had 104 European citizens who were selected for from each country and participated in the final plenary session that delivered uh, essentially the foundation for the treaty, the treaty changes. So what would be the natural consequence of that? This is to replicate the same process and give the power to uh, ratification to that Citizens Assembly, European Assembly, by a double majority voting. We pass it on to the next. Hi, just a couple of questions. Um, one on the on the comment by the last speaker. Um, certainly, there have been citizen assemblies. It did not work when it came to the European Constitution Project in uh, 2005, 2006, for reasons that we all know. A similar pr proposal was attempted in Chile, and it was also rejected by the electorate. Um, and I would question how democratic either of those groupings were in terms of representation by the people after all. Neither they were they were representative of certain organisations, but they were not elected by anyone. Uh, more generally, on populism, uh, the suggestion was that Brexit has led to has fueled populism. But I wonder whether the question is not the other way around: <clears throat> is the rise in populism and the Conservative Party's fear of UKIP that gave rise to um, David Cameron's promise of, a, of an in out referendum. Uh, and if there had not been a rise in populism, I think it's very unlikely there would have been a 2016 referendum and there would have been a Brexit. Yeah, I'm very short Very, very short. Very, very short. He's wrong. The, the, the uh, Citizens Assembly the mechanism of selection of the representatives is crucial. We are not talking about representatives of NGOs. 
we are talking about truly randomly selected citizens of a given country. Plenty of questions there for, uh, let's start with Andrew. So take another round later, Richard, if that's all right. I think we've had quite enough questions at the moment. Andrew. Good, yeah, I think uh, in, in a way there's a, there's a common theme running through, through a few of them about how do we uh, legitimize rejoining the, the EU in the UK. And, and I think that also links to populism. So to, to take the populism question first, I think both things are true. I think Brexit fueled populism and populism fueled Brexit. And it's quite difficult to, to separate the two things out. There's a common theme of populism in the EU is being against the EU, which was you know, one, of the, one of the points I was making. And I think uh, the referendum itself, well, referendums tend to uh, bring with them populist type behaviors. They tend to lead to things like misinformation, in fact, on both sides of the referendum, but much worse on the on the winning side. Uh, and, and they tend to, I suppose also we can see support for leaving the EU as, as inherently being populist in other senses, is that populism is neither a thing of the left or the right. It's a kind of thin, or one version, one definition of it, which I tend to employ, is a, is a thin ideology which can attach itself to different parts of the political spectrum. And we definitely see that with Brexit, because Brexit can appeal to Mick Lynch, and it can appeal to Jacob Rees-Mogg at the same time, which tells you something about, you know, about, uh, about Brexit and its intellectual coherence, but also about its populist nature. So I think it's not an either or, I think both things drove each other. Some people who were of populist in inclination were attracted to Brexit and some people who were supporters of Brexit were attracted to populism. But, you know, I, th I think uh, I, th I think at the same time, I think Brexit was really the core issue that lot that runs through a lot of this. So that's the Brexit populism question that leads us on to the referendum. Uh, again, the, get, getting back to the slightly morbid question of uh, what we what we want to have happen before we, we die. I'd like to see two big things uh, happen. And, and the other stuff can sort itself out. One is uh, rejoining the, or joining the EU, whatever you want to call it. And the other is uh, reform of the voting system to a proportional system. I'd like to see, I'd like to see, and I think it is possible to see, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm not saying it's necessarily politically possible, but I think, well, I think it could be politically possible and should be. I'd like to see both of those things happen without a referendum. That's what I would like to see. I don't think referendums are necessarily a good way of taking these kind of decisions. They they can have their uses, but I don't think it's it should be accepted as 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 self evident that you have to have a referendum on the, either of those things. And I'd like them both to happen. I don't know which order they'd have to happen in, but I think they both have to happen. There'd have to be a relationship between the two things. And if you get the one, you can then get the other. But the point I would make is that. I think the UK does have some work to do in first uh, senior level politicians need to need to be willing to openly say that the Brexit was a mistake. But then we have to assert a set of values that have been damaged in recent years and a good way of asserting those values. And those are the values of representative democracy that elected uh, people in institutions such as Parliament are responsible for taking decisions. Uh, one way of, assert of asserting them would be saying, well, we don't necessarily have to use referendums that are actually Parliament does have the ability to take decisions like this on our behalf. That's what I'd like to see happen. In the process, I think there's lots of scope for using things like citizens' assemblies, those kind of institutions, but I think they have to be far to part of a, of a broader system. They can't just, they're not a magic solution in their own right. I know no one's claiming they are, but they have to be part of a, a broader set of mechanisms and changes in attitudes at high levels. So hopefully that's dealt with some of the questions raised. Thank you very much, Andrew. Julie. Thank you. Andrew's answered quite a few of the questions. I think I would agree with him about Brexit and populism sort of being mutually constitutive in some ways. I think without a Nigel Farage, maybe things would have been different, but I think we actually need to go back further to the 1990s and the way in which all the political leaders played into the hands of Rupert Murdoch and committed to having a referendum on the euro, which we never had. Then the commitment on the constitutional treaty, which we never had, nor on Lisbon. And so I think a sort of some sort of fire lighter had been lit that created a problem um, because 
the more referenda were offered and then not held, that created a problem and allowed populists to play what eventually became the Brexit card. And I think I agree with Andrew that in some ways, the where it, let's let's pretend for the moment we can be in a purely rational world where we say we understand what representative democracy is and we can have it sort of without the political backcloth then logically we ought to be able to say if the polit- the leaders of the political parties that fight an election say as a manifesto commitment we will take the UK back into the European Union, then as a manifesto pledge in a representative democracy, the majority party should have the right to do that. But the pessimistic bit of me feels that that's going to be quite difficult (laughs) because both Blair and Cameron held so many referenda on constitutional questions to turn around at the next big constitutional moment and say, actually, we won't bother having a referendum this time, I think becomes quite difficult. But that is technically the correct answer to Graham's question, that actually, we're in a representative democracy, make it a manifesto pledge. The difference, I think, the citizens' assemblies versus conference on the future of Europe, or at least the convention on the future of Europe, was very much what Jens Peter Bonder, and I apologise for citing a veteran Danish Eurosceptic, but he referred to the convention on the future of Europe as Brussels talking to Brussels, that it didn't feel as if it had that democratic link that the conference on the future of Europe later intended to have and which citizens assemblies properly configured do have they bring together citizens and that's why they've worked well in Ireland so I think there is a distinction between the convention of 20 years ago and what citizens assemblies could bring and then that takes me to Adrian's question which is in a sense the outlying question because it's about values and rule of law not specifically about how do we take the UK back in and how do we um have democratic votes. I think some of it's got to be about socialization. I think the fact that Poland has is presumably going to have a change of government that peace are not going to be in government for the next few years gives the opportunity of recalibrating the relationship with Poland. I think Hungary is harder precisely because Orban does seem to think that working with Putin is an acceptable thing to do. Um, The slight problem is simply to say, well, we will in some ways sanction and censure Hungary becomes difficult because the citizens of Hungary do keep voting for Orban. But there are clearly ways within the European Union of imposing sanctions if countries do breach human rights rules, whether within the European Union or whether we need to think about Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights, which would also be another way of looking at some of the issues that um, are at stake in Hungary. At that point, I'm going to stop and cough. (coughs) Stop and cough. Well, carry on coughing. Um, Richard, you are the next one. And then Anthony. Mostly that I'm 90, so I hope I have enough lifetime left. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time. Plenty of time. I'm thinking of the populism thing. I'd like to remind people of G- Jim Garton Ash, who interviewed the people who've written his Stasi files. And he said the problem in authoritarian states is that the people have an inner Steinhund, an internal rebel, who you can't control. And I hope, I hope that um, in, for example, Hungary, the, the inner Steinhunts will, will emerge. But uh, more importantly, I think about the British situation, firstly, I hope they wholly endorse the idea of a manifesto commitment once we have a party that's or or a proportional representation uh, field that will allow that to happen. Secondly, though, I think the 
um, anti-feeling in this country was largely was also a, an economic matter. Matter people felt themselves hard done by in some sort of way, and um, I think and, uh, the cut, the um, freezing of public sector pay may have had a slight impact on this and food banks and all that. But um, I do think that people um, people were anti because and you, sorry. I've been back to Amsterdam and Brussels recently, and everyone seemed cheerful there. And you felt that there was no that, that there was no less obvious economic hardship than you find in this country at the moment. And I think that's somehow, in spite of the negative, in fact, in spite of that, the EU may be, would have actually made us better off. Uh, people think it's made us worse off. Okay, um, Mary, and then sorry, Anthony first, perhaps, and then Mary. <laughs> It's only because his hand is up before yours, Mary. That's all right. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the other gentleman said, uh, in fact, he was 90 years old. I was wondering whether the audience would excuse me if I didn't disclose my age. <laughs> that is Anthony Frost from the European Atlantic Movement. Um, I've just got a quick hypothesis which I'd like the speaker's comments on. I think there's no chance of um, join the, rejoining the European Union again in this country unless we have PR. And what I mean by that is I think there's one chance for proportional representation that will come with the next election if the Labour Party becomes the largest party in government. And that's the chance to have a vote on PR. If we don't have a vote on PR at that stage, the next time the Labour Party gets voted out of government, it will never get voted back in again because the Conservative Party by that time will have gone extremely nativist, extremely nationalist, and the 53 members of the Conservative Party who probably call themselves fascist at the moment will be in power. Thank you. Ask to Mary, please. Thank you. Um, Mary Dushevsky, I've got um, two questions really about the um, about the justice system. Um, one of the previous sessions, um, I think somebody remarked that um, the relations between the ECJ and Supreme Courts in member countries weren't completely resolved. Um, and I wondered, I, I mean, I imagine that one of those is actually Germany um, with the Constitutional Court. Um, but I wondered whether that was really such a bad thing, because in the US, for instance, um, those things aren't resolved either, and they get decided by the Supreme Court. Um, the other is about the ECJ and the um, European Court of Human Rights, because I think there was a real confusion about that, which both sides of the referendum in the UK actually exploited for their own ends. And I wondered if, if the EU is going to enlarge further, um, and Russia has dropped out, and maybe the UK will drop out of the Court on Human Rights. Um, would there maybe be an argument for um, abandoning the Strasbourg Court and just have a, an ECJ where it would be clear who the membership was and um, who it applied to? I think I'll, I'll ask um, our panelists to respond there and take another round afterwards because we've got several more questions. So, um, Judy, if you could start, please. <laughs> I think I'm going to start backwards with Mary's question. One of the things um, about the European Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe is that they are much broader than the European Union. And so I would be quite cautious about saying, let's just drop the European Court of Human Rights. Not least because having a single court might not be the best approach for some of the reasons that Adrian was talking about earlier, that if we're thinking about member states of the European Union, some of which don't necessarily meet the human rights criteria we might be looking for, then actually having a separate court of human rights isn't in itself a bad thing. Um, Yes, I think in terms of the Court of Justice and relations with the national courts, the one that is a major problem has been the German Constitutional Court. Is that is that a major problem? It doesn't seem at any point 
to have impeded the integration process, the time that it slowed things down so that the last country that ratified a treaty was Maastricht, where the the Germans actually ratified Maastricht after the Danes had voted twice. But I think I agree. I'm not sure that the slight tensions between national courts and the Court of Justice are a major problem. Equally, I'm not a lawyer. So if there's if there are lawyers sitting in the audience who want to jump up and down and disagree with me, please feel free. Um, in terms of Richard's comments, yes, I think to go back into the European Union, we pro- we need we would need to have almost a government of national unity. We would need something like a government that relied on the votes of more than 50% of the people. So that having a minority, a government elected by a minority of people in the way that Tony Blair had, for example, so he had a majority in parliament, but he certainly didn't have a majority across the country. I think something that looked more like a coalition government where the parties leading the coalition, both or all had manifesto pledges to go back in, would be a way of doing it. And we probably wouldn't get to that situation unless we already had PR. So I suppose I would be saying in terms of getting that sort of dynamic, then maybe we should all be hoping for a hung parliament where the price for Labour, for Liberal Democrat support for Labour would be PR. But I'm saying that as a private individual and in no way speaking on behalf of my party on that one. Um, And then on Richard's point, um, yes, economics absolutely did play a part in 2016. It wasn't all about nativism. It wasn't all about immigration. There were a whole set of things. And I think public sector pay was was one of them. The whole financial situation was, was part of that. Andrew. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. I will uh, defer to Julie on the relationship between the courts, other than to say I'm uh, instinct. I don't I don't emotionally like the sound of abandoning the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, yeah, I, I really hope we don't we don't pull out of it. I don't think that will happen. But there's lots of things I didn't think that would happen. I hadn't even thought of to say I didn't think they would happen, which have subsequently happened and still happen. So uh <laughs> Uh, I think the question on PR, I mean, I'm glad we're getting into sort of speculative scenarios and how you get uh, mandates for things. Well, I think there's something to be learned from from the uh, 90s in that in 97, the Cook-McLennan agreement had between the Lib Dems and Labour had quite a lot of things in it, which actually were subsequently implemented, although, as we know, no referendum on PR happened. But there were lots of things in there that I think in as far as anyone noticed, gave a degree of legitimacy to some of the reforms that followed in that, in effect, a majority, whether they knew it or not, a majority of voters had voted for parties which had jointly committed to a set of reforms. So I'd have liked to have seen this already happen before the election is coming up now. It's not going to happen now by the look of it. But I would have liked to have seen a group of two or more parties commit to a set of constitutional reforms. But I think the key things I'd like to see a commitment to would be, as I've already said, electoral reform and uh, and uh, reversing withdrawal from the European Union. And I think if you got that into the manifestos of the main parties, of the main opposition parties that are now before an election, you'd probably see a majority of votes cast supporting those parties. What happens next, whether they implement the electoral reform first, whether you end up with a coalition, whether they implement the electoral reform, then hold another election under the new electoral system, then whatever government comes out of that rejoins the EU, I don't know. But I think I think the critical thing in all of that is that uh, a system of PR of some kind in the UK uh, would change the political culture of the UK and make us more able to, hopefully, make us more able to accept the idea of trade-offs, of politics not being a zero-sum winner takes all all game i'm not saying it's the answer to every possible problem you could ever ever imagine but i think it might help us a bit in that direction which actually would make us also perhaps more able to understand and accept more broadly the nature of being a member of the eu that it's not something you're either leading or being victimized by 
it's it's somewhere else in between and actually the uk as we know often did very very well in negotiations so should have been very pleased with what it was getting out of it and i think that's that's important so i mean um the question about whether it will be whether our chance to get pr will go well i mean we've been we've been john stuart mill moved an amendment for pr to what became the 1867 Reform Act. So on the one hand, you could be very depressed by that fact that we still haven't really got it. On the other hand, you could say, let's not give up. It's stuck around as an idea for quite a long while. It's been around even longer than referendums as an idea. So, uh, well, in, in the UK anyway. So I think, you know, let's stick with it. Let's not give up. For me, the objective is to change the policy of the Labour Party on both those subjects, which I know there are other ways of doing it as well. I'll leave them to others. That's enough to be to be sort of going along with. So, and on the economics issue, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we've got a we've got a bigger problem with uh, how far capitalism is actually able to deliver for people, and the fact that there's not an easy answer to that is is connected, I think, to some of these problems of populism we we see worldwide. And and on the kind of nightmare scenario that's being floated, the Conservatives coming back. Another nightmare scenario is obviously the one in the US that could come up. But I think interestingly that I'd rather it doesn't happen. But if it did, it could underline really clearly the importance of European unity. One last round of questions. Thank you to the people who waited so patiently. I think Molly was the first one, then Tim, then Tom. Thank you very much. Just to say to Andrew that there are intensive negotiations around all those issues and Labour is blocking all of the changes. So obviously their membership strongly in support of PR and the leadership, not so much. I was really interested in Julie's sort of dichotomy between people and politicians. I mean, I know you didn't set it up as a dichotomy, but I think that's really at the heart of, of what we're talking about here. And neither the people nor the politicians can by definition be a problem in my view, but the relationship between them certainly has become a problem. And I've got a couple of explanations for that. One is that sort of from the 1980s onwards, politicians, especially on the left, just sort of abandoned a lot of what they had been doing in economic management, redistribution and so on, and left a lot more to corporations and the market. And their voters understandably felt let down because they weren't being protected in the same way they had been. Um, and at the same time, we've seen a breakdown of partisan voting. So people are asking what's in it for me, rather than I'm a Labour person, I'm gonna vote Labour. So both those things have sort of destabilized the way democracies work I see that most clearly here because I live here, but I think it's true in other European countries as well. So um, I think I, I strongly agree with Julie's suggestion that deliberative democracy is part of the answer here. But I think we need to find a way of linking that to representative democracy and reinforcing people's confidence in representative democracy. And in order to do that, um, politicians have to be honest about what they're offering and then deliver it. And I think a, a classic example of this is what's happening with Starmer now. It's going to be impossible to do what the country needs or what Labour want to do without taxing wealthy people more. And yet they're limiting themselves to sort of non-doms and private schools, which is going to be like six or seven billion, whereas they need 100 billion to do you know, most of what they're proposing. So, yeah, I think that that refusal to actually be honest with people is bound to lead to disappointment. So I think those that and actually trusting people more and engaging them more in the discussion about what their future looks like, rather than just a cross in the, on a piece of paper every five years, would help. Good. Pass on to Tim, if you would please. Yes, Tim Hanbot. Sort of picking up on really what Molly was saying, because. Whilst I think everyone in this room is heartened by what's happened in Poland with the election and the CFD is a today writing the revival of liberal democracy, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, on Sunday, we're likely to wake up to the Swiss Box Party. Sorry, we're likely to wake up to the Swiss Box Party being the largest vote in the forthcoming elections in Switzerland. Uh, Julie referred to Hungary, others have referred to Slovakia. I mean, the forces of populism are not there by any means. And the honesty point may be the way to actually deal with it. But I've got a specific question about how would you cope, looking ahead to 2033, how will the EU cope with a potential democratic challenge in the French presidential elections, which I would term a Trump feedback, should Trump be elected? Will we end up also be seeing a surge in terms of, of support for someone like Le Pen? And secondly, the alternative with Deutschland factor in Germany. I mean, will it lead to the breakdown of the wall? between the centre-right in Germany resisting cohabiting with the far-right, 
or will we see potentially forces in the two largest EU member states just at the time that we, where we may actually have reverse populism in this country with an election and be looking at rejoining an EU that is surging towards a much harder version? So how does the EU protect itself against that and how does it cope with that? Sandra. Uh, Sandra Norman, European Movement. Uh, this is slightly tangential, but involved it for me to quote Swallow Brotherhood. But we might be facing a tsunami of a serious of immigration and obviously across Europe as well. And I don't think it's been talked about enough today. And I think some of these arguments we've just been having, discussions we've just been having, will become rather nice in view of a whole different demographic and an urgent pressing need. I mean, they do say that in Europe, talking about Brexit is a very small proportion of what people are talking about. And one is climate change, and obviously one is Ukraine, but also immigration and migrants. I just want somebody to say something about it because I haven't hardly mentioned it today at all. Um, last comments from, from let's start with Andrew this time, and then Julie to have the final word. Thank you. So, uh, on yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear that Labour are I'm not terribly surprised to hear that Labour are blocking, uh, blocking attempts to negotiate over, over proportional representation on, on deliberative democracy. Yes, absolutely, I agree. There are lots of interesting things to be used there. We see the Irish example of having uses, and I also agree it needs to be viewed as something which works with representative democracy rather than the alternative to it or a rival to it. But on the on the point. Where I've got slight uh, issues around this issue of being honest with voters, I, th I sometimes wonder how honest voters want uh, politicians to be with them or the way in which the political system is set up that uh, if politicians were really honest with them, how grateful the, the, the public would, would be for that. So I think there is a problem there if you're really to tell people what the prospect, their prospects are over the next five, 10 years. Would, would, those, would politicians who do that even get into power in the first place to be able to deliver on their sort of scaled down offers? So I do, I do see a challenge there. And this, this idea, I think one of the other uh, questioners said, the idea of telling the truth. It, truth is a very, very you know, loaded term. And in fact, populist movements base their whole appeal in some cases on the idea that they are telling a truth their truth a rival truth so there are some real problems in there that's i don't think it's just an easy answer to just say uh mainstream politicians should tell the truth because yeah, but i understand that the, the underlying point but i think there is a real there's a real challenge there that that, that i don't have the answer to on uh various scenarios of thing of horrible people being elected or doing well in Europe. Yeah, I agree. It does seem that whenever we make progress in one area, there's there's another there's another part of Europe that that uh, that a, another movement uh, makes uh, has a victory. And so it's very difficult to know whether you're winning and losing in that battle and and what winning looks like. And I, I think it would be a step forward, big step forward, to eject the particular regime we've got in power in the UK. I think there are some very dangerous people, and we heard about the kind of anti, anti asylum rhetoric that we're getting from mm. our own Home Secretary. So I think it'd be good to eject the the current government we've got in the UK. However, I'm slightly disappointed the extent to which the present Labour leadership has in a kind of embraced certain uh, soft. Uh, populist rhetoric in the way it talks about the EU and in a way in some instance it talks about for instance foreign workers in the NHS so for me it's a slight disappointment so it won't be quite I'll, I'll be very pleased to see the current government go but I, I won't be it won't be quite a victory for anti-populism that I would like to have seen. Julie. Thank you um as Andrew was speaking, I realized I didn't answer one of Graham's questions earlier. Did I deliberately exclude Turkey? I thought about it as I was speaking and I toyed with mentioning it, but my sense is by 30, 30 20, nearly a Freudian slip there, by 2033, Turkey is not going to be a member of the European Union. And I think there is a very real question about whether 
Turkey really any longer aspires to be a member of the European Union because it keeps facing both ways, always, whichever seems to suit the interests of Erdogan much more than saying, yes, we have a European vocation. So I'm not assuming that Turkey is part of the immediate scenario of EU membership, partly precisely because of its populist regime. And I think one of the differences is how do you deal with populist if if a country takes a populist turn while it's on the outside of the European Union, you just extend its weight in the antechamber to the point where maybe it never joins. If a country like France switches to extreme populism, then we're going to have to deal with it. And while I suspect we are united in the virtual room and in the actual room in hoping that Marine Le Pen or some other Le Pen acolyte doesn't become French president, at some point it looks quite possible that they might. And at that point, at one level, we could say, well, the whole edifice has to collapse. And yet maybe what we need to be thinking about would be if there was such a populist turn in one of the major countries, one would be hoping that the lesson that Le Pen seemed to have learned from Brexit was instead of some of saying, let's pull out of the euro, she backtracked on that. So maybe there would be a reining in of some of the policies if she were actually in government. But obviously, one would very much hope that she weren't. I mean, I think Sandra's point about immigration is right. It's one of the issues that remains a problem because politicians seem to find it very easy to get cheap votes out of politicizing the immigration question in a way that I think we would all find abhorrent because we seem to dehumanize people, that it's a way of saying, you know, or, this idea of illegal migration. Most of those people are actually, for whatever reason, fleeing their homes. Very few people say, well, I think I'll just go on a boat um, it, from which I might drown, because that seems better than staying at home. There has to be a reason for doing that. And I think we've the we've ended up dehumanizing people in a way. We as a as a country, not as individuals, I hope. Um, and we need to move beyond that. But that goes back to that people versus politicians dichotomy that Molly pointed out I'd sort of raised. And she said, I think she said, neither politicians nor the people can be the problem. Well, actually, I think politicians can be. At one level, the people are there to be represented and it's decisions with, for, by them. But politicians have a lot to answer for. And I think there is a danger that we've got a lot of things wrong and need to think about, again, going back to the phrase I suggested earlier, we need some leadership on some of these issues. And it might be difficult to get ele elected by saying things that are unpopular. But if they're the right things to say, Sometimes that's what politicians need to be doing. Good, thank you very much indeed. I, I think that was a, an excellent panel. I, I'm another round of applause.